good evening. I've been having a lot of letters about that very brilliant thing visible in the eastern sky before dawn. And as I've said on many previous occasions, that is in fact the planet Venus, now almost its best. And if you've got a telescope, you'll see that it looks like the shape of the moon between half and full. In fact, uh, Mars and Saturn are both in the dawn sky also, but they're a long way away at the moment, and they won't be well placed until well into next year. Meanwhile, I want to talk about something quite different and much further away. And I'd like to begin by directing your attention to the star Capella, which is now rising in the northeast and is one of the brightest stars in the northern hemisphere. And close to Capella, you can see a little triangle of stars known as the Kids. And one of those is Epsilon Aurigae, and we did do a complete program about that a little while ago. In the ordinary way, Epsilon Aurigae is rather brighter than Eta Aurigae. At the present moment, it's not, because it's not an ordinary star. It is, in fact, a very luminous supergiant, about 60,000 sun power, but every 27 years, it dims down, because something is passing in front of it, an invisible companion. And Epsilon Aurigae dims down then by more than a magnitude. Well, an eclipse is just finishing now, so before long, Epsilon Aurigae will again be brighter than Eta, and then nothing more will happen for another 27 years. But what exactly is this mysterious companion? I think most people now regard it as a fairly small, hot star surrounded by a cloud of material. But there were suggestions some time ago that it might be a black hole. And although we don't think that now, I think it's a good time to say something about black holes in general. So what do we know about them? In theory, a good deal. But I think to give you the background, I must say something about the ways in which stars evolve. Because all stars begin by condensing out of the gas and dust in those clouds in space we call nebulae. And everything depends on the star's initial mass. So let's consider a mild star such as the Sun. Now the Sun isn't burning. It's too hot to burn for one thing. The surface temperature is about 6,000 degrees centigrade. And inside, the temperature rises to something like 14 million degrees centigrade. So the actual energy is being produced in another way. Now, the Sun contains a great deal of the light gas we call hydrogen, the lightest element in the universe, and also very much the most plentiful. And a hydrogen atom is made up of a central proton, which is the nucleus, around which revolves one single planetary electron. And the proton has a positive charge of electricity, and the electron has a negative charge. And that's the general situation. Now, inside the Sun, where the temperature is so colossal and the pressure is so great, very strange things are happening. The hydrogen is broken up. The electrons are stripped away from their nuclei, and the nuclei then run together to make up a nucleus of the second lightest element, uh, which is called helium. And you can see from that that those four nuclei take up very much less space than the original at complete atoms did. Now, that's the way in which the sun is shining, because every time a new bit of helium is created from four bits of hydrogen, a little energy is set free and a little mass is lost. It's that energy that keeps the sun shining, and the mass loss is absolutely staggering. Well, just listen. Between those two caps of my hand, the sun lost four million tons in mass, and is doing that every second of time. But please don't get alarmed. There's plenty left, and the sun won't change much for another 4,000 million years in the future at least. There is one other point that I think I must make. Um, we've shown you there a uh, representation of atoms as solid blobs, and you can't actually think of atoms like that. It's only one way of representing them. It's not actually misleading. It'll do us for a moment, but uh, please don't take it too literally. Well, what happens then, eventually, when the sun starts to run out of available hydrogen fuel? All kinds of complicated things happen, but eventually the sun swells out to become what we call a red giant star, rather as Betelgeuse and Orion is now, and that, I'm afraid, is going to spell the end of the Earth. And finally, the outer layers are simply puffed off uh, in the planetary nebula stage, and what's left is the old remnant of the star. Now remember, the uh, atoms are now crushed and broken together with little waste space, and so that material can be very dense indeed. It's what we call a white dwarf star, as such as the companion of Sirius is now. And if I could fill my bowl of my pipe with white dwarf material, it would weigh more than a ton. Now let's consider a star which is considerably more massive than the sun. It runs through its life cycle rather more quickly, but it doesn't die in the same way. In fact, it dies very violently. When the energy finally runs out, there's a tremendous implosion, the opposite of an explosion, and the star simply blows itself to pieces in what we call a supernova outburst, ending up as a patch of expanding gas, in the middle of which may be a very small, super-dense thing called a neutron star or pulsar. And the most famous of these supernova remnants is this one. This is the Crab Nebula in Taurus, 
casual gas you can see with a small telescope. And we know what that is because the actual supernova outburst was seen in the year 1054. Although, of course, since the crab is 6,000 light years away, the actual outburst happened 6,000 years before that. Now, the, in fact, the remnant of the star, right in the middle of the gas patch, is incredibly dense because even the protons and the electrons have been fused together. Now, a proton has one positive charge, an electron has one negative charge, plus one minus one equals naught, and so the resulting particles have no electric charge at all. They are called neutrons. And they are spinning around, these stars are spinning around very quickly, sending out pulse radio radiations. And eventually, of course, uh, all the energy will go, and you will be left up with a dead neutron star. But now, let's consider a star which is much more massive still. When the fuel runs out and the great collapse starts, nothing can stop it. It's so sudden and so cataclysmic that the star goes on getting smaller and smaller and denser and denser. And remember, we're dealing now with a very massive star, many times the mass of the sun. And as your star goes on collapsing and getting smaller and denser, the escape velocity goes up. Now, to show you what I mean by escape velocity, take a tennis ball. I throw it up into the air, it rises to a certain height and falls down. If I give it a greater starting speed, it'll go higher, a greater starting speed, it'll go higher, and so on and so on. Now, if I could throw that tennis ball up at a speed of uh, 7 miles a second, which is roughly 25,000 mph, it would never come down at all because the Earth wouldn't be powerful enough to draw it back, and that ball would escape into space. So 7 miles a second is known as the Earth's escape velocity, and in fact, rockets do have to go at that speed when they break away from the Earth. You can see from this rocket launch, it's got to work up to that speed. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the areas. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It has now cleared the tower. Now, let's go back to our old collapsed star. As it goes on getting smaller and smaller and denser and denser, the escape velocity rises to 186,000 miles per second. And that is the speed of light. Therefore, light cannot get away from the old collapsed star. And if light can't do so, then certainly nothing else can, because light is the fastest thing in the universe. So our old, collapsed, very, ma very massive star is now surrounded by a kind of forbidden area into which anything can go, but nothing, absolutely nothing, can come out. So it's really cut off from the rest of the universe, and that's what we call a black hole. Clearly, we can't see black holes. We can only detect them by their effects upon things that we can see. Well, uh, one very good candidate uh, is a system called Cygnus X1. And there we have a, a very massive giant star attended by what we believe is a black hole. And the black hole is, in fact, pulling material away from the main star. And as it does so, the material just before being sucked into the black hole emits X-rays. And it's by that X-ray radiation that we believe we located the black hole. But, of course, uh, there are all kinds of black holes. And uh, now we've actually got to the stage of being able to weigh them. We can find out their masses. And uh, at this stage, I'm delighted to introduce for the first time, but I certainly hope not the last, Dr. Michael Penson of the Royal Greenwich Observatory, Hurstman, sir, who's been uh, very deeply involved in all this research. Welcome, Michael. Now, um, you've been very heavily involved here. I've been talking about uh, star-sized black holes, but there are others. Yes. Well, astronomers have believed for about 20 years now that uh, quasars are powered by very much more massive black holes. Quasars are remarkable objects. They've been a major puzzle for astronomers, uh, as I say, for 20 years since their discovery. Uh, they're extraordinary for two things. One is their extraordinarily high luminosity. We can see them right the way across the universe, uh, back to a, a time when the universe had only a tenth of its present age. So the, life is, the light from the quasar has been traveling to us for a very long time, and they're very far away. And to see them at all at that distance, of course, they have to be very bright indeed. Far brighter than galaxies. Far brighter than galaxies, some maybe more than 100 times as bright as a galaxy of something like 100,000 million stars. So very, very uh, en enormously luminous objects. And yet there's a very strange uh, counterpoint to this, that is that the objects are relatively small. A galaxy, such as uh, one I've referred to with this uh, enormous number of stars in it, it takes light very a long time to cross it, 150,000 uh, years to cross. Yet uh, the quasars vary in brightness in a day. And that shows they're so small. And that shows they're small. In the animation that you're seeing now, uh, in, the, in the large object, when light is emitted from points on its surface and travel towards the observer, if the uh, period of variation uh, is short, then the light, when it arrives, is spread out by the fact that uh, the light has to travel across the object on its, on its way to us. So, so you wouldn't see any variation at all? You don't see variation as large or as rapid as the actual emitted radiation. 
In, the, in a case where the uh, object is small, then the light pulses can arrive much more in phase, and the variations are sharper and can be larger on a short time scale. So that's how we're able to set a limit, since some quasars vary in a day uh, by substantial amounts, we're able to set a limit of a size of a light day. Now that's actually quite a large distance in human terms, but it's about the size of the solar system. And we're comparing an object emitting, as I say, 100 times that of a galaxy, uh, emitting in, in a volume which light crosses in a day, compared with a galaxy that it takes like 100,000 years to cross. And do you think there's probably black holes in the middle of these things? Well, people have believed that for, for a large number of years. Well, I know you've been concentrating very much upon one very interesting galaxy, NGC 4151. Uh, NGC standing for New General Catalogue. And um, that, in fact, is uh, not very far away from the Great Bear, quite close to the uh, core Caroli in the constellation of the hunting dogs. You can't see it with the naked eye or with a small telescope. Um, I did, in fact, have a look at it the other night with my 15-inch telescope, but um, I wouldn't have recognized it as being anything but a star had I not known. But I believe that's of special importance to you. Yes, that's right. This is the galaxy we've been studying and which our research is based. Now, it's, it's a galaxy called a Seyfert galaxy after the American astronomer Carl Seyfert, who discovered a number of these things. And they have properties very like quasars. And it seems that in the center of the galaxy, the picture you see shows the distribution of the stars covering this very large extent across the galaxy. Right in the nucleus of it, however, is a, is a mini quasar, what amounts to a mini quasar, something rather less luminous than the objects that I talked about earlier. But nonetheless, something where the same sort of effects are going on. And if you look through a small telescope, you actually see that central star. Uh, uh, so there it is, uh, for example, that object marked with the arrow on the picture. And it just looks on this picture, which is uh, just like a star, and that's probably what it appeared to you. It's a it rather is dull it, sort of object. Yes, with a 15-inch telescope, I wouldn't have known it from a star. Well, Patrick, we used an 18-inch telescope, <laughs> but uh, it's a rather special 18-inch, not the sort of thing that you'd have in your back garden. In fact, it's a satellite um, mounted in a satellite called the International Ultraviolet Explorer. And uh, this satellite is actually in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth, and the reason it's up there is that it, we, can observe it in ultra, we can observe objects in the sky with ultraviolet light. And uh, there is, in fact, on board this 18-inch uh, telescope, 45-centimeter telescope, um, uh, ultraviolet spectrometers, which are able to split the ultraviolet light of the stars into their component colors. And the important thing about doing this is it enables us to see various different regions of the galaxy, different uh, areas within the, within the center of the object. Particularly, there are three different emission lines that we've been studying, which vary, as indeed the continuous radiation from the object varies, and they vary in different ways, and it's the relationships of these variations one to another which enable us to tell something about the nature of the object. In fact, when the center brightens up, the parts of the gas nearest to it get brightened up first, and so on and so on, until you get the edge. That's correct. Now, in fact, um, we, what we want to do is measure the mass and as a, as a new, as the black hole. That's what we've actually managed to do, and there are two steps to doing that. The first is to measure the distance of the different gas, the clouds emitting different types of uh, radiation, the different emission lines, um, towards us. And uh, we want to measure the distances of those from the center of the object. Now, we do that by, in fact, measuring the delay in the light. The light is propagated from the, from the nucleus, and we see that eventually reach us. And the light travels out, also in the galaxy, until it reaches these different rings of gas which are surrounding the nucleus. And the light, which is fluorescing, in fact, these, the gas fluoresces, in fact, and the light is then transmitted to us. The fluorescence is the emission lines that we see. And the light from the various emission lines arrives later than the original pulse from the center of the object. And so in that way, we're able to associate the delay with the uh, size of the regions concerned. And you could also find out the speeds at which these gases are moving. That's the second vital step. We need both the distance and the speed, the velocity of motion of the material. Now, in fact, when the gas is orbiting the nucleus, the material nearer the center is moving faster in the gravitational field of, of the central object. And we're able to measure the velocity and the speed of motion of this material by the Doppler effect. So these emission lines, in fact, their frequencies change m slightly and are spread out, in fact, because the whole ring is emitting. They're spread out in frequency. And that enables us to tell us the speed of motion to and fro along the line of sight of the material. Now, if we're able to measure in this way both the distance and the velocity of the gas, then we can combine those to work out the centrifugal force. The centrifugal force is balanced, in fact, to keep the gas in its orbit by the gravitational attraction of the nucleus. And that gravitational attraction is, in fact, proportional to the mass. And it's exactly the same, in fact, as the way that you measure the mass of the sun within the solar system. In this case, the objects that you're studying are the planets, the motions of the planets. One is able to measure their speed of motion, their distance from the sun, and from that to work out exactly the same way, the centrifugal force and therefore the gravitational attraction of the sun. 
knowing the constant of gravitation, then you can work out what is the mass of the sun. So the pi picture is exactly the same. One uses the rings of gas instead of the planets, and that, in that way, one's able to work out the mass of the nucleus of the quasar, and it very likely, and almost certainly, the black hole. And what's the answer? How massive is the black hole? Well, the three different rings of gas that we studied, they agree on the result, and that's, of course, very important. And the answer we find is between 50 and 100 million times the mass of the sun. That is staggeringly great, because the distance from us is of the order of 50 million light years. It's a long way away. Yes, we're quite safe. But have you any idea what really happens inside a black hole? What happened to the old collapsed star in the end? Well, according to general relativity, which is our best buy theory of gravitation, uh, what happens once material is past the hole, it can't, it can't escape out of the hole again, passed into the hole, uh, then it goes on uh, towards the center, and in the center it's crushed out of existence. According to general relativity, the, at that point, in the center, the curvature of space will become infinite, and that is to say, the gravitational forces will become infinite. Now, physicists uh, don't like having uh, infinities in their, in their theories, and uh, one would like to get out of this. Now, it's therefore very likely that there's some modifications necessary to general relativity at this point, and people naturally look towards the quantum theory, which is to do with effects on very small scales to explain this. So perhaps some combination of general relativity and the quantum theory will eventually account for this picture. Well, you mentioned gravity just now, and I imagine that um, the possibility of finding out more about gravity really is one of the main purposes of this kind of research. Yes, I think, I think we've been very lucky to fall into a field where we can uh, make a, c a contribution to this because it is indeed in cases where gravity is strong that one can study it best. And I think that it's, gravity is strong where black holes uh, exist. And uh, in this way, uh, we can uh, hope to see differences between different theories of gravity. So in the center of, the, uh, in, in the centers of galaxies, in black, black holes like we've studied, or in c perhaps in cases like Cygnus X1 you referred to earlier, that eventually one will be able to tell the difference between general relativity and other theories of gravity by studying effects under these circumstances. Well, you and your team already had this tremendous success in weighing a black hole for the first time. What's the next step? What are you going to do now? Well, I, we hope to carry out the same kind of research on the, on the more luminous examples. And uh, by going uh, to the Northern Hemisphere Observatory, the Isaac Newton Telescope, which will be erected next year in the Canary Islands, we, ha we should be able to study the much more luminous examples of quasars that I spoke of right at the uh, beginning. And in these cases, the redshift, the d distance of these objects is so great that the cosmological redshift brings the same lines uh, that we were able to study in the ultraviolet in the, in the other, uh, in, in NGC 4151, into the region which we can uh, cover them from the ground. And uh, the, the, so we can actually measure the mass of the black hole in the, in the real quasars. Uh, on the other hand, there is one difference that we will have to make, and that is that because the objects are much more luminous, the whole scale of the phenomenon is expanded, and the distances involved for, to the emitting gas it will be much greater, the uh, delays uh, will be much greater, and so uh, instead of seeing changes occur in, in uh, five uh, days or so, one will, may have to wait up to a year before one sees changes. Well, it's all quite fascinating. And, you know, not so very long ago, quasars really were a total mystery. And is it almost universally accepted now that they really are the active, uh, active centers of galaxies? I think many people believe this. And, uh, I mean, there have been general reasons for believing this before. What we've actually managed to do is to refine the estimates of the mass of the central object from the general arguments which led people to believe they were about this sort of number to a factor of 10 and refine that and get the answer to a factor of 2. Well, that certainly is a tremendous step forward. And many congratulations again upon this great feat of weighing a black hole for the first Thank time. You. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. So um, I think you'd agree that all in all, black holes are the most bizarre things in a universe which are even more bizarre than we dared to hope. And uh, since this is our last Sky at Night of 1983, from Michael and myself, good night and a very happy Christmas to you all. That edition of The Sky at Night can be seen again on BBC Two.